to the point with Michael Williams. It is a taxpayer funded program to give youngsters a jump start on school. So how come so many youngsters are failing and a different viewpoint on domestic violence an award winning story with a message from three young sisters. Good morning and welcome. We hope you're having an enjoyable long 4th of July weekend. Today we have a little different take on to the point for you instead of talking politics as usual. We have two of our Contact 5 investigative reporters here to talk about investigative reporting and some of the stories they have been working on. And we're going to begin with a report that shows nearly half of Florida's four and five year olds are not ready for kindergarten. All youngsters are eligible for the taxpayer funded voluntary pre-kindergarten program known as VPK. The Contact 5 investigators found though that 45% of the children who go to VPK fail the test given when they start kindergarten. Our Contact 5 investigator, Sam Smink, has the story. What is the name of that number? Four. Four. Point to the J. I love teaching that age. They're like little sponges. For 25 years, Patty Page has been teaching voluntary pre-kindergarten, a free program that gives kids a jump start. It helps teach them social, pre-math, pre-language, literacy. How many cars are there? One, two, three. We use a flip book and we test them. There's three different assessments that we do throughout the year. And the results are impressive. 95, 97, 92. Sounds like they're ready for kindergarten, but here's the problem. These are just practice tests. The real tests happen after summer break when the kids are in kindergarten. According to those scores, half the kids in Florida fail. Why? Are they failing? Most of them have never had uh, used a mouse or a computer to be tested on. Two years ago, these kids went from flip books to computers. The letter A. I was at this on my computer. Yeah, you're teaching them one way, and then when they go to kindergarten, it's done a different way. What was this happening? Another issue, students don't take the test until kindergarten after a three month summer break. At home, they could be sitting on grandma's couch all, all summer watching TV and not doing anything educational. And then they forget everything that they learned in VPK. How can people not look me in the face and, and tell me that they're not ashamed that we haven't created a, a system where we know what is quality and what is not? State Representative Vance Lupus of Miami Dade admits with the way the testing is, they don't know if the scores are accurate or valid. But we spend $400 million a year, and you can't tell me which programs are doing well and which are not based upon the current assessments. He introduced a bill that would put the test at the end of the VPK school gear and on kid-friendly tablets instead of a mouse. And for somebody who's been in this, in this work for 10 years, I know how important this is. 42% of the state's VPK providers are at probation level because the kids in their programs scored low. How does getting a low score affect you in your daycare? I get put on probation and then you could lose your VPK. Six, seven, eight, eight. It could mean a lot of schools will close down. Nice try. Try again. Shortly after that story aired, the state said that they were going to uh, give a fix, uh, kind of help those uh, evaluations when it came to providers. Um, but just yesterday, we reported that they kind of stepped back on that, and there's a lot of confusion going on with these VPK providers. It, it's kind of like, the easiest way to explain it is they get evaluated like teachers, only they're getting evaluated just based on this one test. And this is a test that their students take in kindergarten, so three months after they graduate VPK. It comes back in its own way, and it's reminiscent of the longstanding discussion, this discussions in the state about accountability and how we get there. But right now, you have, most importantly, these young students and their parents wondering, are they really ready? And teachers who are in limbo. So where's your sense in talking to your sources and contacts of where we do go from here? The VPK providers say the, the first step really should be that the test is given at the end of VPK. Because right now the test that they're giving these uh, now kindergarteners, Usually that test is given to kindergarteners so the kindergarten teachers can kind of gauge where they're at in their skill level, except that that's not happening. When they take the test, the scores are just going right back to the VPK providers. So they're asking, well, why are we being judged on something that's happening three months after these kids 
are in our care. So they think the first major step that needs to happen is that the test is given at the end of VPK. And they were a little bit happy about what the state had suggested, which was that Governor Ron DeSantis had said they were going to start counting what's called learning gains mm. as the score. So it wouldn't just be this test result is your score. It would be, we're gonna count learning gains, we're gonna see where a child's at when they start VPK, and when they end VPK. They said it was going to happen. They were going to count these learning gains in the next year. They, their press release, their statement said it was in accordance with state law. And just yesterday, suddenly they said, well, no, it was only actually proposed. We're gonna hold pause on this and get more public input. Talk more about the frustration with lawmakers. I know child advocates have been pushing for these style programs for years and years. We all know the value, the importance of getting to youngsters early to help them on that learning path. And I heard the frustration with one lawmaker, but talk about that ongoing sense. Because one question that I think a viewer might be asking is, why in 2019 are we still having this debate and discussion with so much good research is out there on how to help young children get ready for kindergarten and beyond? Lawmakers are just very frustrated. Uh, you saw Representative Alupis, um, Senator Gail Harrell of Stewart, and then Representative Aaron Grawl of Vero Beach. Uh, they all separately, uh, will Grawl and Alupis together separately put um, bills in both the, the Senate and the House of Representatives that would completely change the way that these VPK providers are being held accountable because everyone is in agreement that with the way the system works, with the kids taking the test in kindergarten and then those scores going back to the VPK providers, they have no idea if this is even accurate. They have no idea if this is even a clear view of whether what it's kids really value are. Added for these yeah, children. whether it's you heard him say we we don't know if it's valid or accurate. So these VPK providers say we don't mind being held accountable. We want to be held accountable, but you got to do it in a fair way. And speaking of accountability, we're going to talk a little later in our broadcast uh, with both you and our other contact five investigator will be joining us in a moment about how you make sure and will, and I know it because I see the glint in your <laughs> eye, will continue to hold a, a light to this very topic to make sure oh, that the yes. very questions you're asking are going to be answered. It's all part of the investigative journalism you do every day. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, so stand by. Sam, good to have you with us, and Thank thanks you. for tackling this most important topic. Another Contact 5 reporter will join Sam and me. We'll look at that story and then talk to both of them about investigative journalism. Welcome back as we look at some of the work of our Contact 5 investigative team. Our next story by Contact 5 investigator Maris Badcock earned a prestigious Murrow Award, the subject domestic violence done through the eyes of three children. Here's Maris's story. Another round of bullets hits my skin. I'll fire away, they say. I won't let the shame sink in. Even though, um, I'm kind of upset with my dad. I still love them both because they were my parents. This is what it looks like. I wish they had gone their separate ways. When three little girls. I'm afraid of losing all of my family. Have to pick up the pieces from domestic violence. She was trying to help us. What is your last memory of her? Fighting for us. <laughs> Shot Kelly on the outside, the burla cost. The picture perfect public image shattered by deadly violence. Oh, my dad was choking my mom and stuff. Her daughter was running down A1A. And they were arguing. To escape her husband. Didn't really know what was going on because I was only five. Divorce papers show that their marriage had fallen apart. But then I saw my sisters crying and I knew it was probably something bad. Ian was reaching for a gun. The police killed my dad after my dad killed my mom. A family member coming over and leaving behind a flower where Gemma Berlikoff was killed. Uh-oh, what's going to happen now? For five years, Bryce, Brady, and Blaine Gemstone fought to overcome the horror of what happened. Like, sometimes if I think about my mom, it makes me think about my dad. Nightmares and anxiety. Then it makes me think about what happened. Withdrawal and depression. I try to push it away until I have to bring it out. Even five-year-old Blaine, who was a baby when her parents were killed, can't escape the side effects. Because when the parents are fighting, I think something's gonna happen. Through tears, time, and weekly therapy sessions, the Gemstone Girls learned how to cope. You have to get mad, get 
So when her teacher assigned a social issues project... Do you think it affects third graders? Probably a lot more than people think. Brady courageously chose domestic violence. But when the time came... They said I couldn't do it because it's not third grade appropriate. With support from their counselor and grandmother Linda, the Gemstone sisters turned to Contact 5 with a life-saving message. It's okay to talk about it to some people because it will help you feel better. Do you think your mom talked about it enough? Like I wasn't aware of the situation until after it happened. So you didn't ever know it was that bad? I think she tried, but like she didn't do enough because she was scared that she would hurt us. Three sisters sharing their story. I used to hear this on TV and stuff, and I was like, nah, I'm fine. I got a perfect life. Never going to happen. But Even if it helps, just one. One day it did, and it changed completely. I want to stress that police shot and killed the girl's father after he reached for a gun. If you or someone you know needs help getting out of a violent relationship, we have a list of resources on our website, WPTV.com. A gut-wrenching story about the human cost. I remember the night that story aired, you could hear a pin drop uh, throughout the building. Uh, but it was a story that almost didn't air. We had a lot of debates in the building. Talk about that and the decisions that went into saying, yes, we're going to go ahead and do this story. So I think one of the major issues, you had very young children talking about a very adult subject. And so I think that juxtaposition was a big concern. I know we had a big roundtable discussion in our newsroom where we pulled people from all different areas and you know asked them for feedback on this. It was um, one of the major, it was just the biggest point of concern we had. You know, We were worried that by airing this story, because they're so young, would their message be lost? Um, but ultimately, I think that the reason we decided to go forward was that you know, they were silenced by the school. They were told they couldn't talk about it. And that's kind of the root of this problem. That and also deep discussions with their families and loved ones and guardians now who said we want them to have the chance to speak. That was a big part of it too. Absolutely. We, I wouldn't have even put a camera sure. on them. Um, so we did a lot of background research. We talked to a lot of people in their community, um, their, God, uh, their grandmother, Linda, um, their therapist. Um, all these people came into play and it was a definitely took a village to get this story off the ground. Before we broaden our discussion into investigative reporting in general, talk uh, about how the girls are doing today, 2019. So we still keep in touch. Um, they're doing well. I know one of them did get to talk about domestic violence as a social issue project um, after this story aired. And the oldest, Bryce, she recently placed in the Do the Right Thing essay contest. So that was good to hear. Maris. Sam Smink rejoining us, who earlier in our broadcast talked about the voluntary pre-K program and a lot of the issues going on there. As you both join us and talk about investigative journalism, it strikes me uh, as we kind of pull the curtain back a little bit for you at home about the kind of discussions we have on every story and most particularly investigative stories. Do we, don't we? Do we have everything buttoned up? Well, what don't we have? What do we need to pursue? Sam, I'll let you pick it up there. It's not just an A to Z thing uh, oh. by a long shot. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so you, typically how it happens is, is we get a tip. Um, that's either an email from a viewer, a call from a viewer, or some sort of story or anecdote from a friend or someone we know. We take that tip and we start to do the research. And I mean, this research could last days, weeks, months. Um, we are trying, we don't ever put a story on air as an investigative team without making sure every sentence that's going on over the air is backed up by fact. And so it's very important for us when we do, like this is something for viewers to know, when you do give us that tip, uh, send us that email, make that call. If you have paperwork, send it to us. If you have some sort of record, because I always tell people that's one of the hardest things someone can fight if they're, it's written in paper. And Maris, speak to the same point. I, I know because I get to see your work up close and you all talk to me about it. There'll be times where you say, after months sometimes of looking into something, this story didn't lead where the tip told us it would. This story is not fair. This story is not what people said it was. It, it's not something where you go in with blinders on and indeed, and I think it's most important to know, you go in with eyes wide open to where will it lead if anywhere. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you'll get a tip. You could spend a couple hours to a couple months investigating it only to find out that, 
you know what, this isn't a story. And those decisions, they, you know, they, there's a discussion that happens and um, you've spent so much time on it. So it's, you know, you, you almost feel like uh, all that time feels wasted, but in the end it's not because you're, you're, you know, you're finding out that this isn't a story and there's no benefit to putting this on the air or, or maybe it was a ruse or a ploy or And, and it's like about that. sourcing and double sourcing Absolutely. and triple sourcing and literally checking every word. And I think sometimes uh, there can be a misconception about that. When you talk to viewers, uh, uh, what do you find are some of the biggest misconceptions about I-team journalism? That it's, that it's instant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do have those stories, we like to call them dailies, that maybe it's a smaller scale type of thing. Oh, there's this scam, here's the proof, it's happening, we put it on TV in a day. Uh, but the rest of those stories that you see, her story, my story that aired in the show, I mean, they don't, we just don't snap our finger because we have the, the good thing about investigative journalism is that we have the ability to bring more context to a story. And I think, uh it's important to note, investigative journalism isn't always, as we've seen in these two wonderful uh, examples, gut-wrenching though yours was and important as yours is, but there are two wonderful examples, and I will use the word wonderful in the sense of it's not always just about political corruption, though certainly you all have delved into that. It's not always about whether your money's being wasted, though you've delved into that. It's not also about a crime that maybe went unsolved, though you two have done wonderful work on that. It's about voluntary pre-kindergarten. How do I put the pieces together and connect the dots? And for you, I know on the voluntary pre-kindergarten story, you're continuing to work on that. People often don't realize you're gonna be following that story for a long There's time to come so like a bulldog. Many, exactly, there's so many questions I still have as I dig deeper into this issue and with each story we air, we've already aired about five concerning VPK. There's still so many questions, so I know I still want answers, so I can only imagine that those watching and those who are actually in the VPK K system have answers, so I'm determined to get the answers. And, and Maris, I know you're, uh, you want to talk about two bulldogs, these two. <laughs> when I say when they're on a story, uh, they run it to ground and check every source, every fact. And Maris, talk about that same process for you. Even when a story airs, there's a lot of follow-up work you're doing for months afterwards. Well, I think another misconception about investigative work is that, you know, you see the final product, it comes off very well done, I hope, to everybody. And, you know, you've put all this time, your best people are on it, but it is a lot of really boring work behind the scenes. Your head is down, you are in a lot of data, you're putting in a lot of public records requests, you're working sources, you're on the phone. It's it's not always like what you see in the movies. Um, so I think that that's another thing that you know people might misunderstand sometimes. How have databases and technology allowed the reach of the work for both of you to be oh. extended? And when we talk about that vis-a-vis -vis sunshine laws in Florida, our analyst every week, Brian Crowley, always talking about the First Amendment Foundation fighting for the right to allow people, including our investigative reporters, to be able to delve into records that can impact your finances, how your city or municipal or county government works, and the like, to look at corruption, to look at these issues. Uh, what are the challenges there? What are the opportunities technology's given you? Technology has made, so one of the biggest moves investigative journalism has gone towards is data. Right. So data sets, databases, Excel spreadsheets. I know it sounds boring and it can get a little boring and uh, overwhelming, but these are numbers that can't be argued. And so data has really opened up the scope of investigative journalism. Now we can look at bigger pictures where before we could maybe only focus on one little area. There's actually um, positions that are called data journalists yeah. and they're making that move towards that. Finally, on a slightly more personal level, there's all different kinds of uh, journalism. Uh, investigative journalism takes a special breed. What was that part of you that said, that's me, that's what I've got to do. First you, Maris, and then we'll let you conclude. I think um, I fell into it uh, by accident, uh, and it all happened because of this criminal case. I'm, you know, the crime investigative reporter. I like doing crime. Um, and there was a case up in Virginia Beach where a, a woman was accused of killing her boyfriend by the man's family. And as we dug deeper, we found a bunch of men that were mysteriously dying around her. And long story short, it became this possible accused serial killer case. And um, as a result of some of our work, the feds were able to arrest her on a number of different charges. Uh, and I was just really 
proud of. So that's what I've got to do. Yeah. Sam Smink, what about you? I think my parents will tell you I want to know everything and I will keep asking why <laughs> until I know it. Uh, and so for me, it, it's interesting because it was back when I was in Fort Myers about six years ago that I first turned into an investigative reporter or, or officially got the title because my boss at the time said, it's so interesting, you know, you, you have that story Tuesday and then you come in on Wednesday with a follow and a way to keep asking questions and to keep, um, you know, knocking it into the ground. And, you know, my, he's like, do you want to be an investigative reporter? And my thought was, I, I, I thought I was being a reporter. I thought that was my job. And, and it, it's amazing just how I see it with Maris. I see it with Wanda Moore. We just have that brain that is just keep <laughs> asking questions and it's never just good enough to get that one it's sentence. Incessant. <laughs> There's no nine to five with these two, two of the best young investigative reporters you will meet. I can tell you that from watching their work and the diligence that they put into it every single day and week. Believe me, when I say these two vet a story before it goes to air, they do. They're two of the best. Keep an eye on them as we do. They're really doing important work for you in this community. And we thank you for sharing a bit of that with our viewers. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. By the way, the 4th of July work was accidental, <laughs> although red, white, and blue. We'll be We're back now. in just We're a moment. We're on the same line. <laughs> I want to thank Sam Smick and Maris Badcock, our two brilliant Contact 5 investigators, for being with us on the broadcast. And if you'd like to send us your comments about today's To The Point, go to WPTV.com, click on the To The Point page. You'll have a section to send us your views. We hope you've had a great 4th of July weekend. As always, wishing you and yours a great day and a great week.